Okay, well, let's start. So uh, let me welcome everyone. Welcome to this, which is the first meeting of what we're referring to right now as the um, R Submissions uh, Working Group with the R Consortium. And um, I'd like to start out by just um, a, a couple of concept comments on the various R Consortium Working Groups. So uh, as many of you know, we have had a working group uh, for quite some time devoted to our validation, the R Validation Hub. And we also have a working group with um, focused on making tables in R, calling the RTRS working group. And now we have um, this working group, which um, the intention is to focus on infrastructure issues, uh, IT issues and the like that have to do with um, moving towards all our submissions. So some of you may wonder you know, why so many working groups? Well, loosely, uh, what I have in my head is the model that the IEEE used in the early days of computer networking. So for instance, um, the ethernet project uh, was divided by where you were on the protocol stack, you know, the physical layer, um, the Mac layer, the media access control layer, the networking layer, et cetera, all the way up to the presentation layer. So loosely speaking, I think that's what we have here is a project where there are overlapping and not independent uh, projects, but I'm hoping it makes it easier for people to um, not become overwhelmed and to get focused within the working groups by having a kind of like a layer on the stack where we're focused. So, so this is the infrastructure one. According to the you know analogy, we'd be down there at the bottom, the physical layer, the the, the media access control, right? Uh, and for other things like the tables, would be up at the presentation layer. How to what happens at the certain levels of interface. So so if this works, um, it'll be great. If it doesn't work, we'll try something else. Now. Um, what I'd like to do, Paul, would you like to make a few comments on, you know, what the, what the environment's like? What... Sure. Um, do you want me to show the um, slides that I got prepared? Sure. Please. Sure. Okay. So let's see if I, I haven't done this with Zoom. So this is a first for me. Okay. And can everyone confirm they can see the slides? Yes, we can. That's good. Okay, let me go to the slideshow format. So um, I thought I'd give sort of a brief overview of some things. Um, you may be <laughs> familiar with this already. And if so, I apologize for going over other um, ground. So one part, if you're folks are doing a submission to FDA, is there's what's called the electronic common technical document. Um, and this sets out the overall framework that a submission would need to take. Um, and it's fairly complicated um, for those who have to look at it the first time, but there's, let me uh, point out where some things are available are through the ECTD, technical conformance guide, which is getting into some of the nitty gritty. And then there's actually an FDA guidance on the topic. So this part in and of itself is actually handled by the Office of Business Informatics under the Office of Strategic Programs. And I think that there's something on the order of over a hundred staff who are working with this type of aspect. Um, you may be familiar with this, but let me go ahead and just mention that there's an overall aggregate uh, file structure, the M1 through M5 um, format. 
So folders and naming conventions are supposed to be set up in a standard way, um, actually all lowercase letters, which this doesn't quite follow. But um, administrative information is prescribing is M1, summary is M2, quality is M3, non-clinical M4, and what I usually work with is M5. Um, and then there's the study data resources. So the ECTD sets out sort of overall framework. Then the study data um, actually sets out how actual clinical trial data and other sorts of studies should be submitted. There is a entire website um, for study resources. Um, and then we have the study data technical conformance guide. And this is the part that is worth looking at on a regular basis. It's usually updated twice a year. So their um, ongoing requirements or changes tend to be reflected in the technical conformance guide. And let's just see if we can click on that. Let's see. Uh, I'm sharing the application, so you're probably not seeing this. So let me just skip that. Um, that was probably, I don't think you guys can see that, can you? No. No, no. okay. Let me not confuse the issue then. Um, sorry about that. So um, we can make these, um, these are all public links um, in this particular one. So I can share the slides with you later. Um, CDISC is probably something that everyone is familiar with. It stands for the Clinical Data Interchange Standards Consortium. Um, and it comes in a variety of different forms. We have the Study Data Tabulation Model or SDTM. Um, the idea of an analysis data model or ADAM. And then there's the standard for exchange of non-clinical data or SEND. So, Typically, the last bullet will be things for like um, animal data. Um, most of the statisticians and data scientists will be looking at SDTM and Atom. And most statisticians mostly deal with Atom directly. In theory, um, the idea was that SDTM would be close to the raw data. Atom would be derived directly from SDTM. And at one stage, the idea was that it was one uh, procedure or R function away from the actual results. Although I don't think that particular um, model has worked. So this is the basic setup. Um, let's see if I included any of the other technical aspects. Um, SDTM has some different types of variables listed. There are the required um, things like the study ID, domain, use subject ID. Um, those that are expected, they should be present, but they could be missing. Um, so, for example, a death flag um, should be present, but if no one dies in the study, then there would be no point in including a death flag. Um, and then there are things that um, go by the term permissible. Uh, we want the data if it's collected, but it may not be. So some of this um, would be things like ethnicity, investigator name, and so forth. Let's see, timing variables. Um, this may be something you're familiar with, but SDTM timing uses ISO 8601. And essentially, um, there's a, actually it's discussed in on Wikipedia. The, what it does is it's sort of a reverse. It starts with the, highest level, the year, month, date, hour, minute, second, and then even, um, I think it's um, hundredths of a second or 
it can go to thousands. Usually expressed in local time, but it can be in Greenwich Mean Time. Um, the part about this that can be somewhat challenging is that essentially this is an interval um, estimate. If you only know it, the day on which something occurred, you'll lose the last part, the hours, minutes, and seconds. So it could be any time during the day. And most of our software programs treat that as a point estimate and um, give it a start time, say, at the beginning of the day. And what that can do is create a problem is that an adverse event can be registered as ending before it actually started, for example. So that's something that can occur. Um, so without going into the details, I thought it would be appropriate just to point out there's all of these references and resources that specify um, how things are to be submitted. I think most people are familiar with the fact that XPT data sets are used. Um, what may not be quite as familiar, for example, that's embedded in this um, study data technical conformance guide is the idea that um, data sets are supposed to be limited currently to five gig per data set. So there may need to be splitting of data sets, say for labs and questionnaire data. So those are some of the um, trickier parts of this. So there are, are literally um, hundreds of pages of documentation that I've very glibly just put up links to. Um, so on that note, let me do a stop sharing. Um, and I guess the next thing um, is to turn it back to you, Joe, and ask if there are questions and comments so far and details that you'd like to see further. Thank you, Paul. So, um, questions. All right, so I guess the, the I, next I would thing... have one question, sure. if I may. Sure. Uh, it took me a while to unmute, but... Um, Thank you for the summary. And so that part of the infrastructure is not what do you expect to receive um, from the health authority side? Um, how flexible do you think this is for negotiation or for improvement as we, if we were to move towards an awesome submission? Because I particularly would like to see that what we submit is runnable code. So we give you essentially a collection of packages that have all mm -hmm. the data, the, the, the analysis code, the data derivation code. And for that, our packages are a great format. Um, that's certainly something that can be negotiated. Um, the one thing that's embedded in all of that are some of the naming conventions. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, one downside right now is that the systems are set up that file names are supposed to be, including the um, dot suffixes are all supposed to be lowercase. Okay. So the standard convention for R code is dot R <clears throat> with a um, uppercase R, whereas this would require a lowercase r. And I think that also would make it impossible to submit an R package that gives you the documentation because they have like namespace has to be uppercase in description. So that might be something that we would have to negotiate. Um, Well, if I, if I could comment, Paul, and thanks sure. for the great summary and hi, everybody. It's great to see all of you again. Um, how, maybe take this a step further. To me, I think the real nugget that would be, this is really pie in the sky kind of thought, is if we can pass not just the code and not just say the packages that we use to do the, the analyses and the submission, 
but the actual analysis execution environment itself, then you have everything baked in mm -hmm. and it's literally just running in like a container or some kind of, you know, average service, choose your adventure in, in cloud computing or whatever. But then there's like no ambiguity on like what's being transferred. It's like the exact same run times or packages are versions as what we in the, in the, in the companies are using. I know that we've been pushing the envelope a little bit on some initiatives, especially with CID, but mm -hmm. I wonder if that's something that we can take into this at some point. I know it'll take a lot to get there though. Yeah. So the, that's been a um, mooted in some other venues such as Fuse is can we, can say a sponsor just say, um, say they have an instance up on a, in the cloud, say AWS or Azure, and could they just give us access to that environment? Um, I don't think that will quite meet with um, regulatory requirements because sure. um, what happens if, well, there, there needs to be the ability to go back and look at those, the data sets and the environments, you know, basically work with the actual data at a future point in time in some cases. So if there's mm -hmm. basically a, say, serious adverse event that occurs in the future for a, a drug, right. there may be some desire to go back and look at the totality of the data. Mm -hmm. um, so I think in that sense, um, having a an environment that's just say there and then is um say closed when the sponsor obtains per approval definitely will not meet long-term fda requirements yeah that makes a lot of sense i was thinking it'd be something where and we even talked about this in the project you and i cooperated on mm -hmm. the past um if we give you the instructions for deploying it, you all do that at your infrastructures. When that's obviously another can of worms right. of having your own infrastructure to support it. If we give you like the recipes for it, yeah. And if it's done the right way, which by the way you did, um, tried we can, anyway. <laughs> we we try. Well, we got something up and running. Um, uh -huh. It may not have been optimal. Sure. But um, Eric and I worked on a CID project. Um, Eric did most of it. I just did a little bit of facilitation. Um, oh, don't sell yourself short. It was very helpful. <laughs> well, <clears throat> yeah, we're, there were still issues. Um, yeah. So the uh, we ended up having to kind of th make up the, our own rule book and go around some rules, which may have worked yeah. okay for a CID submission where we're allowed right. a little bit more free leeway, right? but probably would not work for a standard regulatory submission. Yeah, I realize it's a different mindset and it's a different set of rules. I mean, not to sound harsh, but it's definitely a more higher set of rules, I would think, in terms of what's been established already. Uh, right, and trying to get a Docker environment and everything set up and passed into um, FDA through the submission gateway has been a challenge to put it mildly. Hmm. Um, basically the containers I can stand up, for example, aren't allowed access to the local hard drive. Um, okay. So there's various sorts of other rules. Um, in principle, I think Docker containers and something along those lines make a lot of sense. I think that would be the way to go. It's trying to get things to work. Um, a lot of things that are set up, for example, um, to take advantage of Linux tend not to work as well with our available machines because our IT folks with the exception of some servers are almost exclusively um, Windows based. Interesting, okay. So trying to get 
those environments and different operating systems synced up has proven to be, um, let's just say challenging is perhaps an understatement. <laughs> uh, so a quick follow up on that, Paul. It, so is every reviewer's desktop environment potentially different in terms of R? Yes. That, that's something that maybe worth some consideration in the future. That's, that's, a, yeah. that's a challenge. <laughs> but, but yeah, I, I so. I'll go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so um, it turns out I wear many hats. You just don't see them all. Um, <laughs> one of the hats I wear is, and I probably need to get out of it, is I actually manage a, a cluster or a group of workstations. So those I can control and I can control the environment and the packages and how that's set up. Um, so that's actually what we did with, uh, in working with Eric is um, when it was specified, we needed this R with this um, and actually used, I think you used PackRat to get all the packages. Right. So in that case, since I could control that environment, I could set it up. We have had discussions of setting up what we are calling a um, statistician's desktop, but that's more of a concept um, that we're you know still in progress. So um, in that case, one could standardize it if we have sort of like a VM that everyone logged into and it had a standard suite of tools. Um, but that's going to be a while away just because just um, negotiating the licenses to be able to do that with our standard software products is going to be problematic. Okay. Um, so we can do that. Um, what that does suggest though is use of appropriate package managers, uh, whether it be PackRat or RENV, um, will be one of the major steps we need to consider as part of the submission process. Yeah, I agree. Let's do the things that we can control better first, and then you know, obviously the the bigger items I think will hopefully fall into place later on. But package management, by far, is one of the biggest things I try to champion around the projects I work with. So. So, Paul, this is Sean with our studio. I guess one mm -hmm. of the questions I have, maybe you could help shed some light on this. It seems like, from our perspective as a software provider, mm -hmm. we're talking about problems that have been widely solved outside of the realm of FDA submissions. So, could you help me understand more? Like, it sounds like you're sort of on an island with very little support from. Uh, an organization that claims to like want to innovate and, and we'd love to help with that. H how do we go about like this group at the R Consortium, like approaching the FDA internal like IT structures or whatever it might be that at some point are going to have to change? Because like this conversation about dot lowercase r dot uppercase r, it's almost absurd. So, so like I appreciate what you're saying that we have this, you know, that you've gone out and done these things with Eric. Well, what can yeah. we do to expand beyond kind of the island of, of influence that, that you have access to? Um, that's a good question. I wish I had the solution. Um, essentially, we have, I won't say we've set up a second IT shadow network, but we almost have. Um, we're, we're, we're calling it scientific computing. Um, and so one of the problems that as a government organization we encounter is there's sort of the business government type of side of things. And then there's this need for um, a computing infrastructure that will support all of the science that's there. And so that's why we've actually developed um, something called scientific computing. We have a scientific computing board and 
that tends to be where we do a fair amount of work. Um, our high performance computing centers are actually outside of our Office of Information Technology and Management. Um, or actually Information Management and Technology. So there, yeah, you're, you, you might say island or sort of um, parallel system that has been developed um, over time to actually facilitate and enable the science to be done. Um, what we can do um, is try to engage with some of the key partners, um, say um, with the submissions process itself to see if we can do some, um, we can't overturn everything, but I think having a pilot that would be an actual R submission and see if we can obtain some waivers without having to uh, break the entire system. Yeah. Uh, Would be a long. next step. So within Merck, we also try to build a pilot study that have part of analysis using R to submit to FDA mm -hmm. in next year. And we summarize some of our understanding in a slide deck. Would you mind I go through that to share with the team here to see if that's a common understanding based on the current infrastructure we had? Sounds good to me. Oh. Okay. Uh, let me share my screen. So basically, what we trying to do probably as a pilot in next year is to submit, submit one analysis using R based on the SDTM and Adam data that already been created by SAS. So our strategy is more focused on the analysis side to generate mm -hmm. table listing and figure. And our scope is more focused on the primary or secondary efficacy analysis, because that's typically the part uh, that require a sponsor team to submit the code to FDA. And this is in line with, I think, the document that you just mentioned for the FDA study data technical conformance guide. Mm -hmm. And those part highlighted um, is more of related to analysis side. Because from the guidance, I think the minimal requirements for primary and uh, secondary efficacy analysis. Mm -hmm. and we also need to mention what software to be used in over ADRG. And we also understand that uh, the code itself based on current FDA guidance is not to say it's actually executable from FDA reviewer. It's more like a source to help reviewer to understand what's a key variable and algorithm we use to perform the analysis. Correct. Yep. Um, actually, I was part of the committee that wrote this. Um, mm -hmm. So um, uh, yes, the idea was that .exe, for example, is will be rejected outright. So mm -hmm. if somebody writes a, a specific executable code, it will not be allowed to be submitted. Um, sure. And part of that's just um, essentially to guard against viruses, worms, Trojan horses. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, um, so other parts, um, yeah. So essentially it's supposed to be in um, ASCII text, which is what the typical R data set Mm -hmm. Excuse me, not our data set, but our program is submitted right. in. So we should restrict the code written all in the ask to text. So those special characters should be avoided. Correct. Mm -hmm. And that's partially where things are with their, there is a, um, before we even get the, programs and data into the, past the gateway and into the electronic document room, there is a 
staging area that actually will scan everything mm -hmm. and ensure that um, we're not being hacked or corrupted data files are being submitted. I see. Yeah, and so that's how we try to build up over tentative solution for the mm -hmm. pilot mm -hmm. study. And this is actually the action item we are trying to pursue. So internally, we perform over analysis in a R markdown document. And what we're trying to do is to extract the R code from the R markdown and put into a TXT file. And we also do certain compliance check to ensure the R code only contain ASCII mm -hmm. factor. And uh, also we will have a readme file to summarize the running environment we had. And in the ADRG or ARM, so we will provide step-by-step -step instruction to say like what's our version and K package and it's our version that to be used to rerun okay. the analysis. And another part to ensure if a reviewer really need to run the analysis, we try to give a, a public available R Studio package manager pass that have the same snapshot as we had to run the mm -hmm. analysis. Mm -hmm. So if a user, for example, in a Windows computer, they want to run the same environment, they can install from this uh, uh, repo to get the same version they need. So that's uh, one way we think that's probably lower the uh, environment, running environment uh, to reproduce the results. I'm not sure that we have the commercial version of the package manager widely available yet. So this way, we don't need a commercial one install Inside so this is the community team. edition? Okay. Right, this um, is a public available link, as long okay. as, uh, yeah. So you can link outside of the uh, internet, they should be able to download the package. Okay. That should work. Um, and we're actually um, attempting to do something along those lines internally. Okay. Well, is um, there a way that you're aware of that we would be able to deliver um, the exact set of source code of the packages that we used along with the submission instead of hmm. relying on a public um, package manager? The short answer is I don't know. Um, we could, that might be something we can explore. Um, so you're basically saying you would have all of the, um, or are you talking about using like a, say a package manager to have a, all the packages um, compiled together and then download so, it? Or what exactly did you have in mind? <clears throat> open for discussion because in any validated instance that you, um, are putting together, you're going to need to have snapshots of your packages available on your, your local system somewhere. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. like uh, our Studios Package Manager project or, or product is one solution to that. Um, but the gist is that at any point, we're able to recreate our environment ourselves um, with whatever qualified environment that we're using for the submission has been set aside. Um, so it sounds like a big piece of this would be understanding the best way that we can give you those components so that you are able to reconstruct it yourself. Um, and it, I, I, I'm hearing the limitations that you have there, but if I, I'm kind of having a public access point for this is one, one piece, but um, I mean, w organizations are gonna have their own individual packages that they're gonna need to hand to you sure. at some point as well. So there's, there's different pieces of that puzzle. Um, if, they're, if it's a internally developed package that say not on CRAN, or say widely available via GitHub. Um, I think there would be some concern about validating that package. Um, so let's just assume for a second that every package that we're using has undergone that validation process. And let's say that we can provide documentation or supporting um, pieces for that. Uh, 
one potentially could submit all of this as part of a submission. Um, I'm not quite sure how, um, what type of validation will be considered sufficient. Um, I think that's still something one would have to um, consider and negotiate. Um, so I guess one, one area that we have done, for example, and maybe Keevan can comment on this, is I know GS Design has been um, externally validated and actually is part of the Moderna SAP back um, submission that uh, is actually going up for an EUA. Yeah, we, uh, one of the Merck alumnus, I guess, is a statistician at Moderna. And uh, I was very pleased to see that that was there. We've also been going through um, um, further testing and we should mm -hmm. have by the end of the year so that code coverage for the package is over 80%. Um, you know, for any new package we do, we're doing it according to our, you know, system development life cycle, which includes specification and validation. So we're prepared for an audit of any package, I think that we would submit for any critical analysis, um, if that's helpful. Um, but, uh, and also, um, Yilong, do you want to mention the potential way of submitting a package according to the current uh, ASCII yes. limitation? So while we discuss the question, Mike, you mentioned to submit internal package we developed to FDA. Uh, one way we trying to say is like to zip the R package into a TXT file. So the general idea is that uh, we leverage the key component of a uh, source code in our package, and then use a special character to separate each file and put into one TXT file. And then we can unzip that uh, into uh, the original R package if a statistician from FDA run a code from a function. So you can see one example here. So this MK serve is one of the package we try to develop internally to for some survival analysis method. Ah. And then okay. we put all source code into the TXT file and using another function to unzip into an original package folder structure. So instead of to having a FDA statistician to go through a lot of files in our package. So that can be combined all in a one TXT file structure. Yeah, and yeah. Elon, is the idea to put that conversion function into a package that could be available on CRAM? Right, so we have a colleague currently developing this kind of feature and trying to public that package and definitely in a validated way. And then FDA statistician once installed that package, we can provide instruction to unzip from a TXT to a package that can be loaded into the uh, the uh, Windows machine from FDA side. So, well, that sounds interesting. I, I think um, <laughs> it is a yeah, it is a complicated well. I, I was thinking that Sean would probably say that's kind of a complicated workaround to get through this. Mm -hmm. um, well, the, the simple part is you don't have to go through the FDA bureaucracy. Yeah, so, so sometimes the technical solution that avoids having to tangle with the bureaucracy is, act, it looks like it's the long way around, but it's actually the shortest path. Um, yeah, I can I, definitely I admit, see that. I, I could see that, but at the same time as like a enthusiast of all these enabling technologies that I get to use every day at my, my job with obviously containers and HPC and cloud deployments, the technical side of me just admittedly feels kind of sad hearing yeah. all the hoops mm -hmm. that you have to jump through just to get yeah, there. 
there's, yeah. there's short-term solutions and long-term solutions. Right, right. Yeah. How much yeah. make so, progress in the interim, you know, and yeah. then move towards more sophisticated methods in the future. Certainly. I mean, also our packages and the structure of our packages historically have been proven to be quite beneficial. Um, I mean, the FDA probably is also interested in like having, you know, all the features that come with it, having the help files and all the other things. So th this is true, but the um, we have our own issue. Well, external folks have issues with our um, bureaucracy. We have our own internal issues with our bureaucracy. Um, so the gateway, the office that manages the gateway is actually separated from the actual end users. And that sometimes can lead to issues and problems. Um, I mean, we're still using XPT files, um, which is a 20 year old standard. So, um, and I've seen two attempts to replace those with XML, but um, it still hasn't taken place. So um, uh, kudos to our colleagues for their ingenuity with uh, some of their workarounds, but I would agree that it would be good if um, we can revisit some things and see if we can um, work with folks, but it's probably going to, um, just from what I know of how their gateway systems works, it's probably going to take a while to um, A, build up a justification for why it needs to change and then actually B, implementing an actual change. So if I think that um, I realize from the outside that that looks kind of um, idiotic at times, but. Um, yeah, Paul, another thought is that. It takes a while to change. If, Go ahead. If you need any encouragement from, you know, say pharma, they are active in this area with, with Transcelerate. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you need advocacy from the, uh, a group like that, in addition to say this, um, you know, we could certainly work on that. I think that would be helpful. Um, I know that the current OIMT head, um, Amy Abernathy, has worked with actual clinical trial data and understands some of the issues that are involved with her experience with Flatiron. So I think trying to um, say, okay, let's actually sit down and figure out how to do a better process. Um, one of the issues is that um, nobody would do things the way we do them today if we had to design it today. Um, a lot of it is left over from various legacy systems starting from, well, over 30 years ago. And then basically things accrete knowledge and other things rather than basically being redesigned from scratch. So at some stage, it would be probably helpful to um, consider how to update and modernize the submission gateway. Um, But, you know, that, that's easy for me to say because I'm not a part of the office that handles that. So it's kind of like saying to your neighbor, it would be nice if you could paint your house. <laughs> so, so, Paul, is, is that office that owns the gateway, is it really one office or <clears throat> is it really like another some group that's charged with security that they defer to and another group that, you know, has various other responsibilities. 
Um, the gateway is handled by the Office of Business Informatics, which is actually um, under the Office of Strategic Programs. And the group that actually does the gateway is mostly contractors. And in my experience in working with contractors in a federal setting, um, they're not necessarily interested in improving the process per se. They're interested in fulfilling the terms of their contracts so they get paid. And, and I so say what's the easiest step to make a small change? Like, how do we get to uppercase file names? I think that's the well, first. <laughs> yes, that okay. Very, 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 very uh, naive suggestion, maybe. Um, but I'm sure that um, the our consortium has some routines in place to make sure that the submission that come to the crime servers are legit and not uh, some malware or something. And then mm -hmm. maybe there's some possibility to benefit from the procedures um, um, rather than working over text files. I mean, I can see that, um, you know, you need some checks to not being getting stuck and stuff. And I totally hear you like trying to renew things is very difficult. I hate to say it, but the simplest way, well, okay, so part of it is I, don't, well, it sounds good from outside if um, a government organization could borrow from a foundation, such as the R Foundation, um, the likelihood of that being carried out is close to probability zero. Um, it, there would have to be a contract, it'd have to be let, there's a specifications, it's a government bureaucratic nightmare. Um, I can think of one way, and you, you're not going to like this, but it, it's the um, workaround system is um, you submit everything in lowercase, and then you write a script that then takes all those lowercase things and attaches uppercase, and then it lets you work with the R project. So you, then you're back to Elong's solution. You can <laughs> also write yeah. it. <laughs> so, so, so that is, uh, believe it or not, that's probably the easiest step. Mm -hmm. so, 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 Paul, I had a, a kind of an, another question for you, which goes all the way back to sort of what Eric was saying at the beginning, which is that in some of these pilots, um, the FDA reviewer has kind of come to the pharma environment as opposed to the pharma's environment coming to the FDA. Um, and you express some concern there that you know uh, a sponsor may need to keep an environment around you know indefinitely. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to understand. I mean that that actually seems very feasible compared to some of these other things we're talking about. Um, you know, shelving a Docker container or an AMI or whatever um, mm -hmm. is it, certainly easier than writing a script that messes with the case of my file names. Is there any like appetite there? I guess in the FDA for that type of model where a sponsor's environment becomes the source of truth? Or are we really in a world where everything has to kind of be thrown over a wall into the FDA? An interesting question. Um, my own concern is that um, FDA should always be able to look at the data in its environment. Um, and part of it is, I may trust a company's statisticians. I may trust the IT folks. I'll tell you what, I don't really typically trust the marketing folks. <laughs> um, Everybody's and, in agreement. <laughs> yeah, so... I could see where um, at some point in the future, um, marketing folks might get control over some of the environments, at least partially, and say, slow down things um, as a way of thwarting investigation. Um, 
the like the other providing um you know investment and uh banking functions you know within a company right and then you know i could also see bad players within a company even saying okay we can we can basically track if we control the environment we can track everything that fda is looking at and knows. and we can anticipate Essentially, you can see the cards that are being dealt to the FDA, and we can anticipate how to game that. Um, I'm not saying that your companies are necessarily ones that would do so, but if that power exists within a company, I am not sure I trust everybody in all commercial enterprises to behave in an ethical manner. So, so can I ask you, I've been, I've been told by a senior um, person or senior in age <laughs> that um, health, um, the pharma companies used to give actual PCs like computing physical boxes to the health authorities. And they at some point said, you have to stop it. We're filling halls with your computers. But it right. seems like almost the easiest way is to give you a PC without a network card <laughs> or a laptop <laughs> nuts. And, <laughs> and then uh, you can essentially on your own term um, yeah, access at, to the, our environment. At one time, because um, Steve Wilson probably um, has reminded me that back in the 80s, um, this was done that in order yeah, yeah, the that's... government procurement in IT was so lagging that an environment was physically given um, to enable this. But at the same time, there was still the paper submission, which- <laughs> you can go back to that too. <laughs> yeah, if you've seen um, the paper submissions, um, there's like truckloads of them. I've seen pictures. Truck, <laughs> yes. And I can tell you, I've seen, I've dealt with a submission that I looked at. I may have actually once hit print um, accidentally, and I realized that there were 10,000 pages in this submission. And then I had to hurriedly go cancel the print job. Um, so I think part of it is let's identify what needs to change. Um, it might be something that can even be advanced um, through various channels. Transcelerate is one, even PDUFA um, is a possibility. If, um, companies say when there's time at the PDUFA negotiations that we would like FDA to modernize its gateway. Um, I know what FDA negotiators will say is that, okay, we'll FD, um, let's negotiate what that will cost and how that will proceed. So most likely won't be prohibitive. True. Yes. I, so I would we're... guess so too, but those are some of the um, aspects that occur. So, so we... industry has its um, has some mm, leverage as well as FDA. Well, I mean, especially if you don't follow the accretion model you mentioned, Paul. Um, but uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. So we're running out of time here. This, this has been, I think, a, a fascinating and, and help productive discussion. Um, some administrative things. I will work, I'm a little bit behind, but I will work to get a GitHub repo set up that will include um, the video recording and um, the minutes from the meeting. And please, if uh, Yilang and um, Paul, if you could send me your slides, I will make them available too in the repo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we should decide on the next meeting and maybe the cadence of meetings uh, you would like. Um, is um, if this time slot or perhaps a little bit earlier would be, um, would be better. Uh, 
So how about sometime in January is um, the week of maybe the second week in January. Is, is that a good time to meet next or the week of the Monday the 11th? It would be Friday the 15th, uh, 9 or 10 a.m. Pacific time. Anybody looks, have any? Uh, looks fine for me. Works for me. Yep. Yeah, I'm fine. Okay. Yep. Good Works. for me. So 9 15, 9 a.m. Pacific. And I'll make sure everybody gets an invitation. And um, uh, we can, um, once the GitHub uh, set up, we can use the issues and um, you know, and whatever to continue the discussion in between time. So um, thank you everyone. And uh, let me know if, if I can do anything further to, um, you know, facilitate communication. Thanks for setting this up. Thank you. Thank you. All right, you're thank most you. welcome. Thank you, Joe. Take care, Thanks, everyone. Thanks everyone. Have a good evening. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.